Chris uh, complained that when I've given this talk before, I don't talk enough about menstruation. <laughs> and, uh, and I can't promise I'm going to speak all hugely more about it than I normally do. But uh, as these things happen, uh, I prepare a whole load of stuff to tell you. And then when I start talking, whatever comes out, comes out. And uh, it may well miss some of these points that Chris wants to raise. And I, will, I trust that he will ask the appropriate questions should that happen. Um, what I'm going to be talking today about is a system of taboos which is uh, widespread around the world actually in very different forms and, and what's interesting about taboo is that uh, while the individual practices can be quite different, uh, the way they're structured and the way that they anchor themselves onto human experience uh, is extraordinarily consistent and it's really that anchoring which uh, is what I want to try and uh, discuss or describe to you today through the example of the people I've been working with, the Bambinjere uh, or Bayaka living in, in the Congo and, uh, and the way that they uh, live this particular system of taboos and I think it's very illuminating for a, a whole range of different issues that uh, include in particular uh, the roots of the gender division of labor, which is an extraordinary phenomenon across the world. Uh, and I hope at the end I'll be able to uh, do justice to that claim uh, and not disappoint you all. Um, so uh, I'm going to take you through how I understood this system of taboos because I think that that is partly accounts for their extraordinary longevity uh, and extraordinarily wide distribution across many many different hunter-gatherer cultures and as I hope I will uh, be able to in, uh, at least indicate uh, uh, in, in some small part uh, still present actually in our European cultures today uh, and uh, although with recent sort of mass marketing, supermarket culture and so on, we're losing some of the, the old history of how uh, the gender division of labour was uh, in our societies. There are traces that still emanate up till today. So I'll just let a few people settle down. That's alright. Why not? Yeah. So today I'm going to be talking about this group of hunter-gatherers. Um, they're uh, probably the largest group of hunter-gatherers in the world today. Uh, estimates between 350,000 and 900,000 people, so almost a million people perhaps. I mean there certainly are a million people who have uh, 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 who are part of these hunter-gatherer groups, um, but uh, those who are still able to hunt and gather effectively are, are much, much smaller, and probably between 60 and 100,000 individuals still able to live uh, as hunter-gatherers. I had the good fortune of working with this group here, the Mbenjele, or Bambenjele, as uh, you properly pronounce a plural in Bantu languages, um, and, uh, and they uh, call this Ekila, as do all the other groups here and right across until about this area here in, in Central Africa, uh, in Democratic Republic of Congo uh, and uh, the groups on this side uh, they call it Ekeri and if you know uh, in linguistics L and R is a classic slippage uh, set of a phoneme and so it really is the same word. Now this uh, might not seem very surprising, you know, why not, but uh, genetic studies now show us that these groups uh, last shared a mother with these groups about 27,000 years ago. So actually we're talking about a cultural concept which has an incredible longevity and, uh, and its longevity is part of the actually uh, a puzzle, you know, how is it that something could exist for such a long period of time among such diverse groups of people because today uh, these groups they speak languages uh, which are Sudanic in origin, which are uh, East African languages, whereas uh, the Bambenjeli, for instance, speak a Bantu language, as I just mentioned, whereas their neighbours, the Baka, with whom they share a shared past, speak an Ubangian language. Uh, Ubangian languages and Bantu languages are, uh, I mean, it might be equivalent to British and Persian uh, in terms of their difference. So you're really talking about some extraordinary diversity linguistically, yet you have these taboo structures, musical style, which I'll be discussing next week. Uh, and ritual practices which are remarkably similar. 
um, and also material culture. I mean, the material culture is perhaps one of the most strikingly obvious uh, similarities between these different groups. Um, but what I really want to talk about is how this system of taboos that's generically referred to as Aquila actually serves to, to make a whole cosmological superstructure apparent and relevant to the lives uh, of these hunter-gatherers. Uh, and, and it does so by uh, provoking each generation through these really strange things that you have to do. Uh, desirable foods that you're suddenly not allowed to eat, or, or uh, uh, restrictions on your movements that are imposed by what's happening in your sister's body uh, if she just begins to menstruate, for instance, or your wife's body. Uh, and, and, and things that just make you think, why on earth should that happen to me? And, and it's precisely that process by which these striking unusual requests or demands are imposed on you that makes taboo such an effective medium for the transmission of actually much more complex and less easy to ground or conceive of uh, conceptions uh, that exist in the cosmological world of these hunter-gatherers. So in a sense what I'm arguing these systems of taboos do is they provoke each individual as they go through life to uh, wake up to a broader cosmological uh, structure that gives sense and meaning and connects up the different elements uh, of their culture. And particularly, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk about the gender division of, of labor uh, and how this uh, pans up through uh, the world and, and, and across different societies. But crucial uh, to this system uh, Ekila uh, is the symbolic difference between the blood of women, which is the blood of fertility, the blood of creation, uh, and the blood of men, which is the blood of killing, uh, the blood of animals that, that, that uh, is, is caused to fall from animals. Uh, and the importance of keeping these two types of blood separate. Uh, and, and this notion of keeping different sorts of blood separate and the potency of blood is something which is a, a universal uh, human preoccupation. So that's quick to say, but it actually took me an age to, to figure out. Um, some of my first notes in my fieldwork diaries are, you know, uh, I, we went into an area of marshy forest and I suddenly started to get all these leeches. Uh, and when you pull a leech off, you know, you, you really don't like it. It's a horrible, nasty thing. And my instinct was to chuck it in the fire because that would be the really, you know, for sure it was going to die. Um, but uh, as soon as I you know, went to throw it in, someone said, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, you know, why? He <laughs> said, oh, it'll make people go mad. And I just, well, oh. and I was left with that. And, and that was the only explanation. And as time went by and, uh, uh, and other things started to happen, uh, people would say again, oh, that's a kilo, you can't do that. And, and I was puzzled equally, and it seemed they were completely unconnected apart from this same word, Aquila, that was being used to describe uh, uh, the event. So it was really noticing how Aquila and the various practices that people would call Aquila uh, uh, were so counterintuitive, were so unobvious, was, were so seemingly disparate and disconnected that it really tickled my curiosity. And, uh, and actually I think that that's deliberate. You know, Aquila is designed to tickle the curiosity of every generation of Mbengele. Um, and, uh, and so I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, a woman who's menstruating is called, is Aquila. Uh, a hunter uh, who has good hunting uh, is Aquila. He, he, oh, sorry, his Aquila hasn't been ruined. He, his Aquila is intact. Um, the, the heart of the animal that he has killed is Aquila, and he has to eat that if he wants to ensure that his hunting luck uh, is, continues and that he continues to find animals. Um, it's Aquila for a pregnant woman to eat blue dica and even for her husband who may have killed it. And blue dica are very easy to find, very abundant, small antelope that are rather delicious and, and uh, part and parcel of the sort of mainstay of everyone's uh, uh, weekly diet. And so uh, that really does uh, provoke some, some reluctance and, and some you know, willingness or interest in not doing it. Uh, a woman whose baby was coughing, uh, had a sort of whooping cough, uh, blamed it on the fact that she'd eaten a particular 
particular monkey whose hoot has a sort of hoot, uh, uh, sorry, whose call has a, is a sort of hoot um, while she was pregnant and that that's what's caused uh, her child to have this hooting cough and, and it was a killer for her to eat that, that particular monkey. Or if uh, I sleep around, my wife's killer will be ruined and if she's pregnant she'll have difficulties with the pregnancy and difficulties in childbirth and if our children are, are, are small uh, they'll start to get sick and, and, and unwell. And uh, if my wife sleeps around, my Aquila as a hunter is ruined and, and I'll aim at animals and shoot at them, but they'll just you know, somehow dodge it and, 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 and escape and, and, and won't die. Uh, and, and I will wonder why. And so, of course, you know, why are all these things connected by the same word? Why should they all be called Aquila? And as I pondered these over you know, the, the, the few years that I lived in the forest uh, and I started to collate all these different cases of Aquila uh, that people were telling me about, I started to realize some connections between different uh, practices and, and, different b and claims. And it was as I acquired new knowledge from other places uh, about the relationship between animals and people or about the uh, folk biology of home and pro human procreation, it was only then that I started to, to gain a fuller understanding of the implications of these connections that Aquila taboos expressed. And as, as I went through, my, my understanding of Aquila developed, and, and that's very much what I think happens uh, with young Mbengeli. When I talk to my Mbengeli friends about how they first came across Aquila, it's typically in these very striking moments of, whoa, that's weird, why do I suddenly have to do this thing that, that, that I'd like to do, but now I'm not allowed to do it. Uh, and so you, you, get, uh, you, you never get a complete sort of version of Aquila. There's someone who can come and say, this is what Aquila is. No one ever brings them together as a body of practices in the way I'm doing now, just so that I can communicate it to you all. It's something that happens piecemeal, uh, developmentally, as people pass through life. Uh, and that's why it's always a developing theory of proper sharing, actually, because it's about how you share semen, how you share blood, how you share the meat of animals how you share laughter, how you share uh, all sorts of different uh, key elements of recurring features of people's lives. And as I started to understand some of the connections, it reconfigured how I understood or thought I understood other connections. And so there's this constant evolution that's always going on. And, and that really reminded me that you know, we often forget that culture is never complete. It, in a sense, it's always a work in progress in each of us. Uh, just think about the English language. Uh, none of, no one in this room knows all the words of the English language. That's why we all need dictionaries. We, we all get stuck sometimes. Um, in the same way, who here in this room knows all their native dishes of, of, their, na of their mother's uh, cuisine? You know, these are things which are always incomplete. Uh, and culture is, in a sense, always incomplete. It's never a finished job. Uh, and, and that's a, a really important thing to, to sort of appreciate when we're as anthropologists trying to understand uh, how culture is communicated, how it's experienced, how it's lived by all of us in fact. And so uh, in a sense it comes in bits uh, and as those bits enter your uh, awareness uh, they change other bits and they, they lock on to, to different bits and they create new configurations of old bits and, uh, and it's that process which is actually what uh, becoming uh, uh, experienced in your own culture is about. It's about collecting those bits together and, and watching the way they change. So my notion of father when I was a small uh, nipper was quite different to my notion of father as an adolescent. Uh, my notion as father, once uh, I myself became a father, uh, changed again. And as my own children grow, uh, they, they also make me realize different aspects of this idea of father and what being a father. And as my own father gets older and older, uh, again I'm thinking about different elements and aspects of father. So uh, the idea that anything is fixed and concrete in our minds is an illusion. Uh, they're always in the process of flux of engaging with our experience and the world around us in different ways to enrich our own appreciation of our particular culture. Um, 
So when you, uh, you understand that, then suddenly thinking about Aquila uh, becomes a little bit easier because you start to see that, of course, uh, it's something which, which passes through people's minds in different ways and, and certain of those uh, uh, taboos are geared for people at particular ages to, to really force them into thinking about how these cultural concepts are related, uh, how they connect, uh, how they're layered one within the other. Uh, and, and, and what's interesting in particular in, in the context of the hunter-gatherers here is that they're an egalitarian society. Uh, there's no individual who can claim, I know this culture better than other people. Uh, there's no individual who can claim to be the teacher who, who, who will tell you that this is the way we do things, this is the right way. Um, there are ways that groups <laughs> of people do that, and I'll, I'll come on to that later, but there's no individual who can do that. And that, I think, is crucial crucial as part of the understanding of why these uh, concepts like Aquila have such extraordinary distribution and duration. It's because when you have, I can sit here and I could tell you about Aquila in one way this evening and then in next year um, I could change the whole story and, and tell you in a completely different way and uh, all right you might know because it's been recorded that I'm uh, I've completely changed my interpretation but uh, but actually maybe you wouldn't if you were a new crowd of people who hadn't heard this before and so that allows knowledge to shift once you have this authoritative figure who has the knowledge that then they share uh, with the people who don't have that knowledge you have the possibility of transforming that knowledge very very easily and I think think that that's part of the reason why egalitarian societies actually have much greater cultural stability uh, than hierarchically organized societies where you have this constant dialectic of those who have control and power because they're at the apex are constantly remodeling and reconfiguring uh, how they communicate things in order to make sure that this uh, these other people who they're manipulating and and benefiting from uh, somehow don't manage to themselves uh, come to the top and and that constant dialectic leads to this endless change this always fiddling things trying to manipulate and, and, and get them to more to my advantage or more to our advantage uh, and in an egalitarian society that's not a concern of people um, and so it's important to 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 appreciate um, why uh, in this in this uh, context Aquila is so powerful there was an anthropologist in the late 80, uh, 1980s who, when he looked at these egalitarian societies, he said, look, they're just random. You know, if you've got nobody who can judge and say this is the right way of doing things, this is the wrong way of doing things, well, how can anything be secure or can be long-term? How can anything really have continuity across the generations? You know, surely it's just an accidental assemblage of, of practices. And, and he attributed the uh, extreme pressure that many of these societies currently find themselves under in which they're transforming and, and in fact becoming uh, the sort of the, the fourth world uh, communities of this planet uh, as evidence for this you know, lack of uh, coherence and cultural uh, systematization. But, but I think that uh, what, what he missed really was that uh, these collective forms of transmitting knowledge are much more durable, much less easy to influence by individuals. And so in fact they have much greater stability over time than our uh, hierarchically organized modes for transferring cultural knowledge. So the bloody connections that Aquila mediates uh, are, uh, uh, and based on this really striking symbolism, blood is so powerful to all of us, um, uh, uh, really does allow for this core set of understandings about the gendered nature of human life and human cooperation to really be transferred over many, many generations. And what it does fundamentally, uh, as I will shortly explain, is that it makes the sexual division of labor seem natural by defining what is normal and natural for men and women to do. Uh, not as different and unequal, but as different and equal, uh, as autonomous and interdependent. 
um, as intention yet somehow harmonious and it's these uh, slightly contradictory see or seemingly contradictory uh, or seemingly antagonistic uh, forces which actually give uh, a dynamic nature to gender relations in these communities which results over time in them being egalitarian. So I just want to quickly introduce you to the context, the, the sort of social ethnographic context of these people. They're living in small camps like this, uh, distributed around a huge area of forest in northern Congo, about 10 to 60 people, uh, sometimes a few more depending on the season. Uh, if an elephant's been killed you might get up to 100 people, 120 people all coming to feast uh, and sing and dance on the, uh, on the uh, elephant. And people move very regularly. Uh, sometimes it's seasonal uh, appearance of different resources. Other times it might simply be that uh, a friend has so they've heard that a friend has arrived who they haven't seen for a while. They just want to go and visit them. Uh, and the social opportunities uh, of uh, seeing old relatives and friends is as important as the uh, environmental opportunities of different resources being made available. Um, and because people move so easily, one of the main ways that people resolve conflicts uh, is not by, uh, you know, if you have a farm, say, you've got to protect your fixed asset because if you lose that farm you lose your food, but in this context where your, your uh, food is available in the environment around you, uh, you, there's no need to sit and fight, you just avoid each other. And very often conflicts won't even rise to the point where they become overt conflicts that you can recognize. People just simply separate and they go their separate ways and very often time is a great healer and, uh, and it's sorts out the problem so when you met next meet uh, there really isn't the same problem. Um, but uh, one thing I'd just like to point out, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep coming back to this, is the, the way that the camp is gendered. And so here you have the huts uh, around the outside, and you'll notice the children and the women uh, are around the outside, whereas the men are in the middle of the camp in the place called the Mbanjo, uh, and, and will you know, remain in this place. And there was a, a Bantu meat trader who'd often come to the camps I stayed in to buy meat from people. And, uh, and, and he, point, he, he made the quite uh, a striking observation of them. He said it's like two societies, one of men and one of women, because women really do hang out together. They, they have an extraordinary solidarity. If men try and push women to do something, women just say no if they don't want to, and there's nothing men can do about it. There's no means to coerce or, or, uh, or, or force. And in fact, uh, you know, a number of times women have just taken over and they've just said no, uh, we're not doing what you say and, and there's no way you're going to budge us, and, and the men can't budge them. There's, there, there is no way. Um, and the, the way that the camp makes its own decisions is through a system of public speaking, uh, which is most often done by men, but uh, is, is something which uh, is really done by listening carefully to all the different positions of the different people in the camp and the way a good Musambo uh, public speech is given is it, it brings together all the different views and, and positions of the people in camp into something that makes everyone find themselves, yes, represented. Uh, and it's that business of being able to create uh, an agreement uh, which is the art of Benjeli speaking. It's not, uh, it's not about rhetoric and persuasion, it's about consensus building and that's much, much harder harder uh, than just persuading someone of your point of view. So just to uh, you know, I uh, really just you know get clear of this business of egalitarianism, so that the rest becomes uh, uh, clear. I wanted to just use the work of James Woodburn, uh, who pioneered this in the 1980s after witnessing African hunter-gatherers and hearing about certain other hunter-gatherers in the world. He realised that there were these groups who uh, had remarkably egalitarian uh, ways of life, and uh, and he emphasised uh, the importance of direct individual access to resources. You know, no one can stop you from getting the things you need from the forest around you. Uh, and this is of course linked to uh, the freedom people have of movement. For instance, you, if someone leaves uh, a space, uh, a camp, there's no words to say goodbye or, you know, have a nice walk. Uh, the most people might say is, I'm off, and the only response you give is go. 
uh, and that's it. And, th and the reason is, is that you, you can't uh, create those sorts of emotional or other manipulations that make people feel bound to you. Uh, you, you have to, people have to be free to just go if that's what they feel like. There's no reason to, to prevent them, to hold them back or, or to somehow uh, make them feel guilty about it. Uh, it's their absolute right. Divorce, for instance, is simply done by leaving. There's no need to explain yourself. If a woman is fed up with her husband, she just leaves him. And that's that. And he has no right to insist on any explanation or any reasoning. People might well try and, you know, uh, encourage her to come back or... But there's no... She has no obligation to, to justify herself. She just leaves and that's that. Uh, and that's uh, his, his problem uh, to, to, to deal with. Or vice versa. He could leave. Um, the means of coercion is, is very important. All these groups use poisoned arrows or poisoned spears in their hunting techniques and those poisoned implements will be around camp and if you really want to get your hands on a poisoned arrow it's quite easy to do so, it's not, it's not a difficult thing. And this equalizes the potential of course for uh, grievous harm. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm small and weak and someone who's trying to be mean and horrible to me is big and strong because I can wait till they fall asleep and just give them a, a chook with one of these arrows and that will really be that for them. Uh, and so uh, the access to this means of coercion does have implications for uh, sort of self-restraint or self-limiting uh, in how far you're willing to, to try and impose yourself on other people. Um, the other big thing is procedures that impose sharing uh, and sharing really is central to uh, preventing saving and accumulation. If I have something that you don't have suddenly you will start to or I will be able to influence you to manipulate you and somehow modulate your behavior to my advantage in order to uh, for you to get the thing I have that you haven't got. So sharing is really important for preventing uh, power or authority emerging through the control of scarce resources. And all these different uh, egalitarian societies have very elaborate systems for uh, making sure that goods that people need are constantly on the move, they're constantly circulating uh, and some of these are ritual, gifting, uh, the demand sharing I'll, I'll describe in a, a bit more detail shortly uh, and, and, and other forms of, of, of ensuring that things move constantly uh, between people. Um, and the other is leveling mechanisms so uh, if someone starts to boast whew, really fast people start insulting them, teasing them, mocking them, laughing at them, humiliating them. Uh, if people try to seek or, or claim authority over somebody else, the same uh, uh, and, and elderly women are, are particularly uh, valued for their ability to do this sort of mocking. Uh, very important. So avoidance of, as I've mentioned as a strategy for resolving conflicts, absolutely central uh, to ensuring uh, that people remain uh, independent if they want to be. Uh, a lack of dependency on specific others. I don't depend on anyone in particular uh, for obtaining the basic things I need for life. Uh, and that really frees me up from uh, relations of, uh, of dependence and, uh, and, and authority. So these are really uh, central to the social structure of all these egalitarian groups and, and without these basic elements uh, groups are not egalitarian and it infuriates me how a bunch of American anthropologists are constantly talking about these societies as egalitarian societies yet they have extraordinary gender inequality or ageism at their hearts and it's just not egalitarian. The sorts of egalitarian societies I'm talking about are these sorts which are radical radically egalitarian, where they really don't tolerate anybody emerging as a leader. And, and it's a very, very different thing to the sorts of situations that we're used to, um, where <coughs> um, um, where, where it's, uh, you have hierarchies and, and I'm pointing to this uh, gorilla because the neighbors of these hunter-gatherers are farmers and these farmers have uh, quite distinctive uh, hierarchies and inequalities and authority systems and chiefs and uh, gender inequality is rampant uh, in these societies and as a result the Benjeli call them gorillas uh, and the reason is is that they're obsessed with private property and from the Benjeli 
many point, points of view, private pop property is unacceptable. It is an ideology. And a couple of times we've been camping in forest and uh, you know, sometimes arriving late and, and making our camp and, and there's a group of gorillas camping nearby and suddenly the male silverback is roaring and screaming and retching at us and my friends get furious. They won't have any of it. You refing and this and that and using all the worst swear words they use and, and they're really serious. They're really pissed off with that gorilla for claiming this as his forest. What right have you? And, and they say, that antelope's got as much right as you to walk on this path. Who are you making all this fuss? And, and they really do get stroppy about it. And they, they, they point out the similarities between the farmers. And you're just strolling across the farmer's field to get somewhere and then suddenly the farmer comes running out with a big stick. You manioc thief, who are you coming along in my farm? Rah, rah, rah. And, and terrifying you and, and frightening you uh, in just the same way that the gorillas do. And so the name for gorilla and farmer is used interchangeably um, in people's <laughs> descriptions of, of what's going on. Um, uh, and, and it really is this concern with uh, private property. And so there are all sorts of ways that Benjeli distinguish themselves as really egalitarian people from people like the farmers uh, who aren't, or people like us, in fact. Um, and, uh, and so they talk, for instance, about hands. They say, you know, the farmers have hard hands. You people have hard hands. We have easy hands. You ask me for something, and I'll give it to you. Uh, but if, if we ask you white people for stuff, or we ask those farmers for stuff, pff, you've got hard hands, you won't share properly. And, and this business of sharing really is important to them. It's, it's at the heart of how you ensure abundance, and it's at the heart of what Ekila is really talking about. Ekila is all about how to share things properly, and defining very specifically how those things need to be shared. <coughs> And, uh, and so sharing really is imposed on you by other people. Uh, it's not something that you have a choice in, in how it's organized. Um, so this man, Makongo, in the blue t-shirt, he has hunted a pig. And the pig you know, weighs about 60, 70 kilograms, and he's carried it on his back all the way back to camp. Uh, he hasn't just eaten what he can get in the forest and then come back and said, oh, no, I didn't get anything today. He's, he's bothered to bring it all the way back. And the reason he's bringing it back is that his aquila, uh, for his aquila, his hunting luck, to be consistent and, and hold together, he has to make sure that everybody gets an equal share of that pig that he has killed. And so, uh, as he arrives back in the camp, Mbatiti, the man who's sitting here, says, ah, Makongo, you've got a pig, give it to me. And he takes the pig from him and he butchers it into pieces. Uh, and Tato, who's the, uh, uh, an older man who knows everyone who's staying in the, in the camp we're in, uh, and how many people are there and how good their teeth are. Uh, you, you know, if you've got really bad teeth, you don't want a really chewy bit of meat. You need something soft and, and easy to digest. And, and so what Tato is doing is he's looking at the different cuts of meat and he's saying, right, that should go to this household, that should go to this this household, that should go to this household. And you can see just in the background there, there are women waiting and these children are all waiting to get their bit of meat to take back to their house so that they can start to prepare it. Um, and, uh, and this sharing uh, really is uh, very uh, central to the economic life of these communities. And it doesn't just, uh, I mean, th this is the way men share meat, but everything has its rules about sharing. If a man goes hunting with a, wi uh, a dog and the dog uh, catches the animal first, then the dog has to have a particular share, the lungs of the animal that it's, uh, it's helped to kill, uh, or to catch rather, because they, do, they don't kill them, the people kill them. Um, but women, when they collect things like wild yams, uh, they share in a different way, because women's uh, gathering collects things which are more reliable, uh, though often less voluminous than, than the 60 kilograms of pig meat. Uh, and so what they will do is they'll prepare the food in their, in their huts. They may share out a bit with their girlfriends while they're in the forest or and they may share out a bit when they're back at camp but uh, but there's none of this very public sharing that goes on with men's things uh, and 
when they've cooked the food, then they'll send plates around. So they'll send a plate to the men and the mbanjo in the middle of camp, but they'll also share, send plates to their girlfriends at different, uh, in at different hearths. Uh, and so there are numerous ways that things are constantly circulating, and, and the result is that everybody gets to eat. Uh, and when you talk to, uh, when I explain to them, Benjelia, that there are places in the world where people starve, they just couldn't believe me. It was just like, you know, un, un, just impossible. It's like me telling you that there are rooms in, uh, in the anthropology department here that if you go in, you'll suddenly just suffocate. Uh, you just think, nah, come on, you know, it, it doesn't work like that. Um, and, uh, and, and so here you have a, a culture, a society, which has no word for starvation, indeed has no conception of starvation. Uh, and, and that's without leaders telling people what to do and without storing and, and, and you know, people will just eat until they finish what they have got uh, and, and then they'll go and look for more uh, and that's one of the reasons why James Woodburn in characterizing these Im egalitarian societies he called them immediate return societies people go out on the day on that day and whatever they find they share out and they consume and they don't worry about uh, 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 pr uh, keeping things for later you just eat everything you need to eat uh, and this is quite different to the sort of sharing we do. So if I have a big bag of sweets, I may say, oh, you can have some, and you can have some, and you can have some. Uh, and so I've shared my sweets, but actually, no, I haven't. What I've done is I've shown favoritism to three people in this room at the expense of all of you. And maybe some of you might think, oh, well, I'd like some of those sweets. I'm really hungry right now. Well, oh, maybe I need to be a bit nice and, and, and kind to him. Uh, and, and so then, oh, yes, you are very nice here. I have some sweets too. And all of a sudden, my sharing becomes a means for me to assert influence to try and manipulate other people. And what would happen if I had a bag of sweets and you were all bambenjeli, you'd say, you'd say to me, give me some of those sweets. And I'd say, oh, of course, take some sweets. And you just grab a big handful of sweets. And then you'd go back and sit down there and you'd see her with that handful. You'd say, give me some of those sweets. And she'd say, oh, of course, have some. And you'd take some sweets. And likewise, you'd do the same to him and you'd do the same to them. And you'd be doing that to me and then you'd be doing it to her. And, and all of a sudden, those sweets would be way out of my control, but they'd be distributed very quickly around as many of you as could get them. Uh, and that is the sort of sharing, demand sharing, that hunter-gatherers do. And that's the sort of sharing that maintains and, 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 and promotes equality. Um, and of course there are people who don't share and they cause a lot of trouble in these societies. Uh, this is one particular very grumpy woman who, uh, will, uh, who, who, who doesn't often do anything. She, she likes to make a fuss. Um, and there are people like that who just never or very rarely contribute anything. But they always have a right to a share. And you know, people like her are very vociferous in demanding that right. And they won't let you forget it if, uh, if they haven't got uh, things that they need. And in fact, it's widows who play the crucial role in establishing the, the moral code uh, of society. And what they do when somebody, say I was hogging all my sweets quietly here with hoping none of you would see, um, you know, someone, well, one of, one of the elderly ladies here would stand up and you would go in a corner and then just start emulating what I've done like this. And, and you would all start looking around and then laughing at what she's doing because she would do it with a lot of humor. And, uh, and, and I would start to feel really sort of a bit embarrassed. And, and some of you start saying, yeah, it's wrong. Just, oh, you know, pig out on all your sweets by yourself. Yeah, people should share sweets. And other people would start making similar comments uh, uh, what the moral uh, issue is that's going on here and the, and the and the woman who'd be mimicking me would be keeping a careful eye on me and she'd see at first that hmm, I'm feeling embarrassed and insulted and annoyed that she has to bring up my bad behavior like that uh, but then eventually I, I, I have to laugh because she is doing it very funny and uh, and it's when I laugh that she stops doing it and then this and then the problems over and everyone quietens down and gets on with what they're doing and, and that really is how uh, morality is shared in these communities it's not shared in any you know, so authoritarian, this is our rules, this is our dogma, is done in these very humor, humorous reenactments of bad behavior that elicit that moral commentary from the people who are watching it. Uh, and that is a, a very uh, powerful way uh, of, of uh, I'm looking very, uh, what's it, 26 minutes, is that right? Uh, okay. Um, so what, what I really wanted to point out is that uh, 
in this society you have political independence between the gender groups so women really are have a huge solidarity and it's that solidarity which gives them strength in resisting male demands or, or claims and, and they do resist very vociferously um, egalitarianism in these contexts is not a passive like oh let's all sit back and be nice to each other situation it's a situation where you have to assert your rights you demand your shares give me sweets uh, you mock those people who are trying to step outside or, or claim authority uh, you you really do make an effort it's not a, a passive easy thing uh, and that's again why James Woodburn called these assertively egalitarian you have to assert your equality there's no policeman no judge there's no uh, you know, authority figure who's going to say you must be more equal with each other you have to assert it directly uh, and do it vociferously and, and with humor if you want to avoid conflict and that's one of the reasons actually why men can't do this sort of thing because uh, when men do it it really does start fights uh, and that's why the elder widows uh, have a very special place uh, in, in performing this so there's a political independence or autonomy and there's also an economic autonomy uh, women uh, fish they collect wild yams, leaves, vegetables, insects and, and other grubs uh, and, uh, and, and that gives them everything they actually need to eat and, and it's, it's the mainstay of many camps uh, food. Uh, men uh, go hunting, they of course can dig wild yams and collect leaves and, and other things too but, but in principle men and women actually are economically autonomous they don't depend on one another uh, and and that is also very important and in fact it's something which is uh, is so central to uh, being Bambangeli that it's enshrined in the creation myth and normally what I do uh, is I will tell you the male version of the creation myth because it's different to the women's not structurally structurally they're identical but in the men's version it's the men who take the role of of uh, bringing or, cre or bringing human society into its present form whereas in the women's version it's the women who are the key protagonists making society society uh, come together in its contemporary form and so what I thought uh, I'd do tonight is tell you the women's version because I've been telling you the men's version too often um, and because it's a nice version as well um, so uh, it's important to understand you know when Komba created the forest or created the world because as far as the Benjeli concerned the world is the forest they, they really uh, well, I was very disappointed when I was explaining in quite complicated explanation in in, in Bam Benjeli who, who have words geared to, to the forest world about how you get to the forest from from here from London uh, and you know some one of my really good friends he just looked at me and said hey you're a liar <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't believe me you know and uh, uh, but uh, so when Komba created the world he created the forest and uh, and he, he created men and he created women but he didn't tell them about each other and so he put the men's group in one part of the forest and they hunted elephants and pigs and things and 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 collected honey and and then he put the women in another part of the forest not telling them about the men and they uh, they uh, you know collected fi uh, they collected yams and so on and fish as I was just mentioning uh, and what women did is they danced at the beginning you saw on the first slide uh, that spirit with all the raffia coming down uh, and, and women danced that spirit and it was that spirit that produced little baby girls would fall off the, the leaves uh, and, and that was how women uh, made new children uh, and men on the other hand uh, they had uh, this uh, large calabash called a mapombi uh, and it's, they're actually about this big they're quite substantial things they've got a sort of hard shell and then inside this very white milky sort of gooey stuff and, uh, and men masturbated or made love to these uh, Mapumbi and that was their sort of what they had <laughs> and uh, and so um, and as I said I'm going to tell you the women's one and I, I just uh, have to keep reminding myself so I don't drift into the men's one, <laughs> the men's one. Um, so they're living in different parts of the forest now uh, the the key sort of ancestor is this uh, men's version chap called Toli and in the women's version woman called Toli and uh, and Toli I mean actually the women also have another name for Toli Beponga uh, and so uh, it depends who you ask about the myth but anyway Toli uh, was uh, was with with her girlfriends in the in their camp and and she had a dream and in the dream Komba told her that there are these men 
hanging out in this other part of the forest and you're not very far from them right now and tomorrow morning you should go and find them and so Tully wakes up in the morning and her girlfriends go off fishing and she says okay I'll go find these men she doesn't say anything to the girls because it was a dream she wasn't quite sure and so off she goes tuk, 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 walking through the forest walking through the forest walking through the forest and then she's walking and she suddenly sees these footprints and she realizes that ah oh, those must be other people and so she starts following them she starts tracking the men and the men are actually tracking pigs trying to go uh, going hunting and eventually she spies them and she sees them killing the pigs and taking the pigs back to camp and she keeps a safe distance away from them um, and uh, and then when they're in the camp uh, she she decides right this is this is the time to go in and they're all sitting around and roasting pig meat and she walks in and the women have a song about this it goes Toli Amupia Bapangwa and uh, and what it really means is when Toli arrived they all stood up and what actually happened of course they all got erections because they'd never seen a woman before and it just took them blew their minds and so she had sex with them and showed them what a good thing it was and uh, and and then she said oh you know I've got a whole bunch of friends back at camp over there yeah <laughs> they'd really like to meet you and I said, oh great yes take us take us and uh, so the next morning Tolly said look you've got all this honey you know you've got to make sure you parcel it up nicely now and take the honey with you and I'll go back and introduce you to my girlfriends um, when Tully arrived with all these men the, the women were really suspicious and fearful and they said no way are we having anything to do with them look at them and, uh, and, and the men said no no look try this try this uh, and they gave them the honey and, and so the women tasted the honey mm. well maybe creatures that give us something so sweet can't be all that bad and, <laughs> and then slowly they made friends and they got less difficult and, and eventually they all coupled them and started making love and the men were just like yes this is fantastic <laughs> and when they finished they said I want two of these I want three I want four <laughs> uh, and Beponga Tuli she said no 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 one woman one penis they said oh, okay okay all right we accept <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and, and so the men uh, went to sleep and, and the, with the women and, and the next morning the women said look we're going to go and dig some yams uh, and, uh, and so the men said oh, okay and so they sat around in camp but one of the men was suspicious and so he followed the women where they went and, and, and as he followed them into the forest he noticed that there they were dancing this spirit that was circular uh, was whose raffia was spinning and how were coming these little uh, uh, children and, and he said Phew that's something very powerful they went racing back to the men he said oh you know what those women are doing there we've got to have it for ourselves we can't let them keep it so all the men bolted a fast through the forest to the place where the women dancing no stop 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 this is you can't do this you can't do this look we're here now you've got to give us that and the women said okay all right you can have it that's fine uh, we accept them they said look we'll, we'll throw away our mapumbi and they started throwing away their mapumbi now we just come to you and uh, the women said yes yes okay that's fine you keep a jengi and uh, and of course the, women, the men interpret this as a sign of our strength you know ah, we could just demand this really most important spirit from them and the women said no 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 this is actually our strength you know we could give away a jengi so you don't realize what we've still kept for ourselves and uh, and 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 uh, and uh, and, and actually what happened is the men changed the magic of Ijengi so that instead of producing these children now it's still he, he still has this extraordinary fertility but now it's so potent that if women touch Ijengi they'll start menstruating non-stop until they die and, and so now women can't touch Ijengi only men dance Ijengi and that's why in that first photograph you saw it was all the men uh, escorting Ijengi uh, to come to the camp to dance um, but the different ways that men and women interpret this myth are typical of the ways that Mbenjele men and women are constantly humorously vying with one another for uh, either claiming special status or undermining the claims to special status of the other group so uh, for instance when uh, women give birth to children what they're actually doing is they're accumulating male semen in their wombs and turning that semen into the child that is the extraordinary thing women do but the child is actually male semen and then when the woman gives birth she's giving the child and she gives it back to the man and she says here take your child give it a name uh, and likewise when the men do the thing that's really valued which is elephant hunting that they do um, is called a women's hunt because prior to uh, 
uh, elephant hunting, women will go into these special trances singing yele songs and uh, in this trance they, they fly up over the forest and, and they see where the elephants are and then they tie them up and then in the morning they say to the men, ha, ah, your elephant's waiting for you over there and, and then the men just go and, and kill it easily because the women have already caught it uh, and, and it's these constant undermining of the special social capital that one gender can produce by the actions of the other gender that, that is typical of the way that these gendered egalitarian relationships work and of course when we think about our own society's struggles to try and achieve some sort of gender egalitarianism uh, there are some very marked differences in the way these people who've achieved it do it and the way that we're trying to do it which I will hopefully come back to uh, later and so we can see that once you understand the creation myth you start to understand the uh, the spatial arrangement of people in camp uh, and you start to understand uh, uh, why women can be so strong and have such solidarity and autonomy from men because of course they are economically independent uh, of them because the work roles of that myth are still the work roles of men and women today um, and and certain key elements of the myth continue to animate social relationships today so if you're a young man and you've really fallen in love with a young lady what you do is you climb one of these trees and you go right up to the top and you in you've got all the bees stinging you and you just stoically put up with it and use your axe to widen the hole till you can get your hand in there and then you start stealing while the bees are all going crazy around you uh, uh, all this honey from them and, and dropping it down to your friends and keeping a nice parcel so that when you go back to see your your sweetheart you can give her honey just as the men did in that myth and by that she understands that you're really serious you want to marry her uh, and uh, and so uh, you know and it really is dangerous this business of, of climbing for honey many men do fall I just a few couple of years ago I met his poor chap he'd fallen out of one of these trees and it took two days before his friends found him he shattered his leg and he just I mean he had bones sticking out all over the place and he had to actually stay camped under the tree for six weeks until it was sufficiently healed for him to be able to for them to be able to move him and I mean a terrible terrible mess he, he can not walk uh, properly again one of my friends broke his back falling out of a tree uh, uh, and uh, you know he basically can just use one arm and it takes him about just 10 minutes just to crawl around the back of his hut to have a pee it's, it, uh, my wife's a physio and she looked at him and said you know if he was in Europe he'd be in a wheelchair he'd be a paraplegic that just been it's quite extraordinary that he has any movement at all um, so men take huge risks uh, to do this it really is dangerous stuff but uh, they do it because it's so central to 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 how you do things properly um, so the creation myth uh, is really the story of the creation of society as we know it today of men and women living together of having children and raising those children um, and uh, and and so what 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 I was trying to really illustrate is that in these contexts your cosmology is not something abstract it's not this old story that old men tell you or that you read in a, a big thick book uh, it, it's something that you live in your everyday experience it's something that resonates in your social uh, and uh, intimate relations with other people is something that that explains why you are doing the things you do and isn't just so oh, that's that's our culture no no you understand this deeper implication this this broader cosmology that slowly starts to populate your 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 mind uh, and your body as you go through life um, so just to take you a bit further into this uh, living cosmology um, I want to introduce you to women's first husband. Um, now, one of the very common euphemisms for mens women menstruating is that they have put in the moon, and uh, and this is very common in this society. But it's actually you know very widespread uh, in European and many other African and and other societies around the world. Um, and of course uh, when a woman puts in the moon she is a killer uh, and and that's central to uh, understanding actually it's the core of of understanding a killer uh, and so what a is doing is it's anchoring in these bodily experiences uh, that are inevitable for every uh, human body if societies 
going to perpetuate itself over the generations, menstruation has to happen. Uh, there's just no question, it has to happen. Uh, therefore, uh, it's a really good thing because it's not only it has to happen, it's also a really striking event. <coughs> And, and therefore it really is a very good thing to anchor other cultural knowledge onto. And, and that's really why these taboos are so central uh, to people's lives, because they anchor so much cultural knowledge uh, together. And they do it in this physical and biological experience that every human body has to do as it matures and goes through life. Um, and so I'm just going to quote from a friend of mine, Emika. Ekila is the same as Mubeku, that's the name of the medicine Komba, God or the Creator, sent women when women put in the moon when they menstruate. The business of Ekila was first with them, it's all about children. You can see women's tummies swell up at this time, it's the wind. They have to expel their wind as Ekila, as blood. Uh, this cleans out their wombs. If that blood stays in the body, it will make the woman ill. She has to get rid of it. If she doesn't do Ekila, then she has to do Ekila. That's how it should be. Women's biggest husband is the moon. If I'm a hunter, I don't sleep around with different women. If I slept with her and then her and then her and then her, all the animals would know. They would smell my smell and know that hunter has ruined his own Akila, i.e. he's ruined his hunting. Some will come with great anger, others you'll shoot them but they won't die and you'll be very surprised. When you shoot at an antelope from close range and it doesn't die, we call this Akila. So I then ask him, does a good hunter have a strong Akila? No, if someone's hunting is good, they won't say his Akila is strong, they'll say he hasn't ruined his Akila. Even a great hunter who sleeps around with women all over the place will ruin his hunting. We call a man who's ruined his hunting with women Matena. But why do you call all this Akila? Ah, we Yaka call all this Ekila because our fathers called it that. This whole business comes from our forebears. Women's blood is one thing, men killing animals is another. Komba made it like this. When women put in the moon, it is Mobeku. Men's Mobeku is just nose bleeding. Men's Ekila is about hunting, really. The hunter's meat is Ekila. If someone else eats your hunter's meat, then your Ekila, your hunting, is ruined. So that gives you a sense of just the, 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 the polysemic nature of this word. So what Ekila prescriptions are doing is they're resulting in Benjeli men and women cultivating very different ways of, of being in the world, of, of um, comporting themselves. <coughs> and these are perhaps exemplified by they, the way they walk in the forest. Whereas men walk quietly in single file, that's actually me with my son, uh, some years back, uh, in small groups or alone, uh, really trying to sneak up on the animals to surprise them so that we can kill them and, and catch them. Women, on the other hand, walk in large groups with lots of children in tow, making as much noise as possible, and if the children aren't making enough noise, they'll start singing these very distinctive yodels uh, out into the forest. And the idea is that, and, and they're very explicit about this, we want to warn the animals, we don't want them to, to be around us, you know, they, they'll, they'll, we want to get away, move away, move away, there are lots of us coming here. And so they will always make a lot of noise while they, they move in the forest and, and be in these large groups. And that's <coughs> also a reason why uh, they have much greater solidarity than men, because every day, every day, women are moving in large groups together as they go about their, their daily business. And when I asked a, a, a very good friend of mine, I said, so, you know, why, why are you frightened of, of wild animals? Because I was surprised. I thought people who live in this forest all the time would, would not be frightened of wild animals. And she said, no, I, I'm really frightened because I smell of Aquila. And, and I, oh, okay. Um, but actually, uh, you know, there is good reason. Uh, this area of forest, uh, there are about 15,000 Bambenjeli hunter-gatherers in it, 1.3 million hectares. That's about 0.2 persons per square kilometer, which is rather typical of hunter-gatherer population density. Um, but uh, in this same space with 15,000 people, there are 23,000 gorillas. This is according to the local conservation organization, about 9,000 elephants uh, and about 4,500 chimpanzees. And, and all these animals, uh, you know, Digit and so on, uh, Diane Fossey claim that these animals are all very friendly. Uh, they're not actually, you have to domesticate them for them to do all that stuff and that's what uh, the many conservationists do do with these animals. Um, 
actually they're, they're really quite aggressive and, and very territorial uh, and, and that's one of the reasons that Benjeli gets so annoyed with them. But so long as a man hasn't recently had sex or been sleeping next to a menstruating woman, um, he won't smell of human aquila, so he can just walk quietly, sneak up on the animals and, and catch them unawares. Um, whereas women, uh, and, so, and so men will, will focus on taking things from the outside and bringing it to the inside, whereas women receive those things on the inside and transform them through cooking or, or through making them beautiful into things that humans can safely consume and that the community will grow. Um, and so basic belief about Aquila really start to uh, differentiate people according to gender and to a lesser extent according to age. And some of the ways that Aquila emerges uh, come through uh, very early in a child's life as they see their mother preparing food that they feed to the children but they don't eat themselves. Some animals are just Aquila. This is an example of an Aquila animal. This is the blue diker, for instance. Uh, if uh, you're a part of a pregnant couple, don't eat this animal. It's one of the most easy easy animals to catch, you just call it meow, 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 and it comes running along if, it, if there's one nearby. Um, uh, and uh, they're very, very fast breeders, so they're, they're very common animals. And suddenly you're not allowed to eat it. Uh, and the reason is because the head turning backwards. When blue dikers are frightened, they look behind that like this as they run along. And, uh, and, and, and that apparently will lead to the fetus, if your wife is pregnant or if you're pregnant, uh, starting to turn his head. And of course that will result in a breech birth. And so women and pregnant couples mustn't eat uh, this, this, this diker. Um, and, and, and that links into a broader conception of people as part of the forest. You know, the Benjeli for the Benjeli, uh, w when you watch your children grow, it's because the forest is going into them. Uh, they have a taboo against domestic animals. Uh, they only eat wild animals and, and things that grow in the forest itself. And so in a very literal way, they are watching the forest transform uh, their children into adults, grow their children. Uh, and so they have a proverb, you know, uh, a, a, a muaka, a benjeli, loves the forest as they love their own body. They don't have this sense of a distinction and, and the idea that you can alienate parts of the forest and sell it or give it to a logging company or a conservation organization is really outrageous to them. It's something that they really find unacceptable. Uh, and because it really is, it's like me saying, you know, you can give your toe uh, to Chris over here because he collects toes. And <laughs> what are you talking about? So um, these specially red-coloured animals are, are particularly aquila and mustn't be eaten. So uh, one time I, I hunted a sitatunga, uh, which have red coat, and when we brought it back to camp, uh, everyone was cooking it, but none of the women and, and, and couples who were in the process of, of being pregnant uh, would, would eat it, and all the kids were eating it and wondering why aren't the adults eating, and, 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 and that is exactly what aquila is meant to do, start you thinking. And, and that journey then continues of wondering why, why, why. Uh, and then suddenly if you're a girl and you, you menstruate, uh, ooh, suddenly your mother's telling you now I've got to talk to you my dear. They, they don't have a big ritual of monarchal ritual in the way that many other societies do. But uh, uh, the mum will say look, yeah, okay, we've, I've got to show you a few things now. And they go in the forest and she shows her a particular spongy bark which she puts in her cash sex to, to catch the blood. And she says you've got to be really careful with this blood. Uh, when you caught it uh, in the evening you, you go down to the river. Uh, you mustn't put it in the river. You have to put it in dense undergrowth because there's a particular type of spirit called you that uh, that really like this blood more than any other blood and uh, and you know they'll get angry if you don't leave some for them so just leave a little bit for them over there in the undergrowth and 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 that will keep them happy and, and then they won't cause any trouble um, meanwhile back in camp if the camp was planning to move no mustn't move has to stay there for a few days until uh, things have run their course uh, her brothers are suddenly being told no no you can't go hunting with the men you have to stay in camp now uh, and her father of course has to stay in camp now. But it's the brothers who'll be like, oh, why is this happening to me? Oh, you're a killer, you're a killer. Hmm. 
oh, I'm suddenly a kilo, am I? I can't go hunting, okay. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the girl, of course, is being told she's a kilo and, and starting to come, come understand this. Um, but, but understanding why uh, this makes her a kilo is, is something which will take longer. And, and, and it, in fact, emerges once you understand, <coughs> if you spend time talking to hunters, as I have done, that of course you don't, I mean, you know, anthropologists claim that hunters give themselves to people and, uh, sorry, animals give themselves to the hunters and it's all very nice and it's not like that here. Uh, when I tell them Benjeli about those, you know, so-called animist views, uh, they say, no, 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 if you want to catch an animal, you've got to use all your cunning, you've got to all, all your strength, you've got to use all your wile and guile and, you know, and it's hard, you've got to really battle, it's a fight, it's not, it's not easy and life is strong and that's the one thing that hunting will teach you if you ever try is that life is tenacious it wants to stay it doesn't want to give itself up like in those Hollywood movies where you know, boom 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 and everyone just lies down quietly it's not like that at all um, and uh, and so when you understand that then you can start to understand why animals should get so annoyed by the smell of human fertility you know god there's gonna be more of them more beta more trouble it's gonna you know and 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 so uh, when when if I go out into the forest smelling of my wife's tequila uh, and, and I'm standing with a group of friends uh, who, who aren't smelling of Aquila, uh, that gorilla or the elephant will just come charging along and it will bypass me, will ignore my friends and it just comes straight for me boom, and knocks me out of the way. Or uh, uh, small animals, you know, they'll just woof, 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 they'll be just fleeing away, running away from me. Um, and, and that's because uh, I'm the one who's Aquila, I'm the one who's offensive. Uh, it's not the, the guys around me who don't smell of this. Uh, and that's why the women are frightened. Um, and, and so it's only slowly as these other things start to become clear that you start to understand why, what the logic is that underpins uh, these, these different beliefs. Um, and, and it really is with marriage and reproduction, well, when you start getting serious about the business of reproduction, that's when Aquila really becomes something that preoccupies you. And so, you know, understanding the beta then becomes obvious because your husband's out hunting all the time, he's having to do that battle, and it really is a battle to, to kill those animals. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your smelling of, of menstruation, and, and until you're pregnant, that is, and when you're pregnant, he has to stop hunting, actually. Um, and that's, and why should that be? Why, why are you both Aquila now? Well, then you start to learn, perhaps, and this just happened in, you know, in a different discussion with somebody else, wasn't talking about Aquila at all, and he explained to me the business of procreation, that from their point of view, uh, you know, you need to make love with your wife every day, every day, every day once she's pregnant, because you've got to keep feeding semen to that baby so that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, uh, and, and, and <coughs> and that explains why the taboos are on both of you, because you're both participating. It's not, you know, with our medicalized understanding of pregnancy, it happens in this one moment and then it's just something going on in the women's body. Um, whereas for them it's something that's shared work, and that shared work is what means, uh, links those, uh, those two people together in these Aquila prohibitions. So the Aquila stimulates a search in the minds of every Benjeli couple to start to understand these theories of folk biology, uh, these understandings of why menstruation is so important. And if you're ever, you know, not, if your wife isn't getting pregnant, what the Benjeli says, then you really must make love while she's menstruating because that's the peak of her fertility and, uh, <coughs> and, and that's what will really make her, uh, you know, ensure she does get pregnant. Uh, and so, you know, slowly as you go through life, you start to build up a bigger and bigger, more uh, potent picture of, of, uh, of, of how uh, Aquila uh, makes apparent this much broader cosmology uh, uh, of the people that I'm talking about. When your wife is pregnant, one thing you have to do if you do want to go hunting, because of course you know everyone's still hungry, is you take you when the, when she's got uh, when when the belly started to get a little, little bit big, you slice uh, you make some slices with a sharp blade along her belly, and you collect the blood that flows from those cuts in a, a red paste, and and this is the sort of the forest people's equivalent of ochre, is a particular uh, uh, tree bark that. Uh, they scratch and grate and it, and it goes very red and it reddens people's skin. Um, and you mix the blood into that and then you keep it, that little ball in your men have handbags in this society. Um, and, uh, and whenever you
you want to go hunting, you take the little ball out and you wipe it across your forehead. And, uh, and, and, and I, early on in fieldwork, I saw these men wiping these little red balls over their foreheads as they went out into the forest. And, yeah, that's weird. And so I asked someone, he said, oh, it's because he's a killer. Hmm, okay, thanks. That tells me a lot. Um, and uh, and it was only much later when I saw someone actually doing the process on their wife's belly, and and it was explained. Now that's how you make the Mongolia ball that he's uh, wiping on his forehead. And then I started to ask more, uh, and I found out actually what's happening is that those spirits that love the menstrual blood, what they do is they get really annoyed and jealous with the husband for having cheated the moon, having uh, made her pregnant so she doesn't menstruate anymore. So they're not getting those meals that they. They've come to rely upon. So what he does to cheat the spirits is he puts that that little trace of her blood on his forehead and, and you mustn't rub it off, you mustn't touch it, it has to just dissipate in the wind. And so that little smell there, mm, ah, 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 and the spirits are calm and they don't mess up your hunting, cause your arrows to miss or, or big dangerous animals to come after you. Uh, and, uh, and so smell then becomes one of the other vectors that can help you to understand Aquila in a broader sense. And of course in the forest where li vision is a limited resource for knowing what's around you, smell and of course sound uh, really are very important. So th that's something very visceral to, to people living in these places. Um, and, uh, and so Aquilas start to help people to understand what they can and can't do. So it becomes absolutely normal that women should not go hunting, uh, that they should cook food that is brought back from the hunt, transform it into something safe that nu uh, provides nutrition and health to, uh, to, to, the, to the camp as a whole through the sharing that goes on with the food. Or um, <coughs> the style of speech that women have. They have these loud musical forms of stars of speech. Uh, you s they sing, you know, not constantly, but really often. I always used to think American uh, musicals were horribly naff. Uh, but then, you know, the Benjelli, they pull it off really well. <laughs> you know, just someone starts tapping a little tune and singing a little song, and then you'll just join in with something else, and you'll join in, and then before you know it, the whole room is dancing and singing, and just for a few minutes, and then, ah, oh, okay, that was nice. And <laughs> We sit down and we carry on. And it, and it just, in a very spontaneous, natural way, it, it really can happen, actually, um, to, much to my surprise. But, uh, but so, uh, men, we on the other hand, we have all these disguised forms of speech, uh, which I'll talk about more next week. Um, you know, we use sign language, we use all sorts of uh, 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 animal vocalizations as ways of communicating with each other and tricking animals too. Uh, we walk alone in small groups, whereas women are in these big hordes of making loads of noise as they move around. Um, and so menstruation is culturally elaborated to become really clear uh, differences between the sexes and, between, uh, 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 and creates a sort of gender ideology that defines what are appropriate activities for different genders to do. Um, and, but, but while I've you know, sort of emphasized this cosmological ideological aspect of Aquila, if you go and talk to Benjeli about Aquila, it's really practical. It's about the practical implications of why you're missing animals or why your children are always sick or, 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 or why, uh, you know, what, how we can explain this piece of blood that we're just finding on the floor here uh, and, uh, and trying to understand what its significance is. Uh, people will be really practical. Well, no, that's just normal blood. No, no, that's Aquila. Uh, oh, and, and, and discussing. And, and it's in these very practical ways that people talk about Aquila. Um, and 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 the, when rules are broken, it's the practical steps you need to take to, to sort it out that people emphasize. Uh, and so, because it's always talked about in this very practical way, it really becomes like a, a, just a natural way of behaving. That, all that cosmology and stuff I've been giving you in a very explicit way is happening in a much more uh, un, unexplicit, spontaneous, natural, uh, evolving way that, that doesn't give it the sense of someone telling you, but of you actually discovering it for yourself. And, and because you have that feeling of self-discovery about it, it becomes your knowledge, it becomes your cosmology and not simply something that a priest or, or somebody else is trying to tell you is the way it has to be. It becomes a really sensible way of understanding the world and understanding the world that, that you live in. <coughs> So, 
one thing that uh, I hope this has started to suggest is that gender egalitarianism here is not about denying difference. It's about celebrating it. It's about recognizing those differences and, and, and celebrating them in very explicit ways. And, and about how you can bring those differences together in complementary and powerful ways that lead to a good life for human beings. And uh, <coughs> in our society, we're, we're really obsessed with comparing and judging. Uh, and our understanding of what it means to be equal is really biased by our training in mathematics and this little equal sign that uh, is, uh, you know, implies that two digits or integers are identical. They are exactly the same. Uh, they are equal. Um, but that's not how social egalitarianism or, or gender egalitarianism actually works because of course you know, we are all different in, in some way or other. You know, our, our very existence, that's why we have uh, you know, a, a sexual reproduction, uh, is to ensure that every human being is different from the other human beings. Uh, and so the idea that ideology, ideology Logically, we can somehow squeeze all that difference and say it's all the same. No, no, everything's the same. Well, that is going to be another act of authoritarianism. It's going to be another act of ideological imposition. Uh, so how do we deal with difference? Well, from the Benjeli point of view, it's very simple. You have no right or, or, or uh, grounds for judging difference to be different in value. The way you evaluate differences is the key. And, and they don't evaluate differences as higher or better, uh, as one more valuable or less valuable than another. They are just differences. And the art of living well is how you combine those differences together. And that's what systems like Aquila are focused on ensuring. <coughs> So Aquila shows us a very old way in which following rules that emphasize the equal valuation of difference and their interconnectedness in our joint endeavor to lead a good life uh, actually really uh, are at the heart of how you achieve egalitarianism. Uh, it's not about obsessing on sameness, it's about recognizing difference and celebrating it but not valuing it differently. And symbolically, the focus on men menstruation across cultures and ages uh, really is because it is such an important event and it's so striking when it occurs. Uh, it, it is just a, a one, it's, it's, it's like they're waiting for human beings to just stick culture onto. It's, it's just the perfect anchor, the perfect hook uh, for human organ social organization to, to, uh, to hang on. And it's very similar across hunter-gatherers. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. Remarkable. So a menstruating woman who touches uh, the poison on the arrows can, can cause the poison to go off. And this is widespread right across the world um, and, uh, and is, 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 is something which actually uh, echoes up uh, into today's uh, communities. So many of you, if, especially if you're French, will know that a woman shouldn't uncork a bottle of wine, especially not red wine. Uh, she shouldn't even go near cellars or places where wine is fermented. Uh, and uh, even pickles uh, or, or salted beef or salted pork, things that need to cure over time. You know, menstruating women and, and, and often just women full stop shouldn't go near these places because they risk turning uh, the, the process. Um, and, and, and you can see how uh, the very same sorts of beliefs uh, carry into different contexts. In the context of sort of patriarchal uh, societies it becomes a means to denigrate uh, and diminish women whereas in these hunter-gatherer societies it becomes the focus of celebration uh, of recognizing women's power and, and their very special contribution to uh, to, to, to human uh, continuity um, over time. 
It's very interesting that up until very recently, uh, I, I can speak more confidently about France, but I think the tr it's probably true of Britain too, uh, that you didn't have women uh, working in slaughterhouses as slaughterers. You didn't have women as butchers uh, uh, chopping up and, and dismembering animals. You didn't have women surgeons. Uh, you didn't have women soldiers. Uh, you didn't have women priests. Uh, and all these are jobs which involve very potent blood. Uh, in the case of the priest, of course, it's this idea of the blood of Christ. Uh, and in the Catholic Church, uh, you know, if you're a menstruating woman, you shouldn't even go to church. You should stay at home. Uh, and if you uh, go and take the Eucharist, now that's oh, sacrilege. You know, the blood of Christ with the blood of women, whoa, can't happen. Uh, <coughs> and, and so you can really see how, uh, and I mean, there are many other examples that we could talk about, but, but just to give you an indication, and Alain Testard, if anyone is interested in understanding this more, he, he wrote a lovely... Uh, article uh, all about why French women can't uncork bottles of wine um, and uh, and he, he, he did extraordinary work comparing the hunter-gatherers of the world and and I mean he even notices right across the hunter-gatherer groups for instance that women will not if women kill women will kill animals um, you know you food running past you you try and catch it um, but when they kill they won't pierce and cause blood to flow what they do is they knock they cudgel they pick it up and swing it round and break its neck but, but they will, will try and avoid blood flowing uh, or piercing the animal. Uh, and so men will use spears and, and so on, but, but, but women won't use spears and so, or bows and arrows. Um, and, and so you can see that uh, you know, these sorts of uh, uh, practices really echo in much bigger, broader ways than we might at first have thought. Um, so I'm hopefully going to get there, Chris, <laughs> in a few minutes' time. Um, so the Benjeli understand this forest not as a bunch of different, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, ideal types of this tree, that tree, this animal, that animal, but they understand it as this interacting multi-organism. Uh, that although we, you might see at this moment this particular animal as a an antelope, when it dies and it uh, moves into the soil, it becomes trees, and the soils then uh, there's a constant flow of the forest into different forms and shapes. And, and it's like the children eating the, the forest foods growing and becoming strong. Uh, so what they really are focused on is how you maintain this space as a space of abundance. And that is what the sharing is all about. It's about ensuring over th thousands of years that this space remains a really nice space to be a human being in. Uh, and, and what we can see about Ikeda is that what it's really focused on is defining how things need to be shared properly. And when things are shared properly, you will always experience the world as a place of abundance. And this is the, what the Menjelis say and why Aquila matters to them so much. Um, and, uh, and, and if you are uh, suffering in your food quest, if you're, and it often surprised me, you know, when there was no food in camp for a couple of days, uh, no one was talking about, so, oh, well, maybe we should go to a different part of the forest. Everyone was trying to find out who isn't sharing properly. And, you know, and, and there'd be all sorts of conversations in the background about, you know, oh, has so-and-so been sleeping around or, or, or what's been going on? Because it's about sharing semen, it's about sharing uh, your, your food, it's about sharing all these different uh, key constituents for a good life. Um, and, uh, and so these uh, counterintuitive rules make sure that every generation really does understand uh, this process of proper sharing and how it should uh, happen. And because it's not something that's taught from a, an authoritative source, it just emerges organically as you go through life and these different striking practices happen around you. Uh, it's a sort of disembodied pedagogic process. It just happens. Mm, ah, mm, and then slowly you're connecting these things because we are all curious creatures. Uh, it is inevitable that we will be curious and, and these things are designed to make us curious. And so this personal journey of revelation that slowly 
teaches you what proper sharing is uh, really does establish a cultural store of meanings that move down the generations in a remarkably consistent way. Um, because I think, and, and as I said earlier, they don't attribute special status to specific individuals or specific institutions, but they're anchored in these inevitable bodily processes and, and the very pr practical consequences uh, of them in this forest environment. And so Mbengeli religious practice is really geared towards uh, creating dialogues between the, the camp and the forest as a whole. And that's really what matters. It's, it's about maintaining a dialogue because when you have a dialogue, then you can start to demand things from the, uh, the other person in your, in your discussion. Uh, and just as you would, uh, as I was telling you, give me sweets. Um, you know, so you can say to the forest, give me pigs give me antelope, give me whatever it is that you need. Uh, and so uh, creating these relationships of, of, uh, of, of dialogue between the human group and the forest is the key focus of all their religious uh, practices. Uh, and next week I'll be talking a lot more about that. But it's also why they have an unswerving faith in the forest's ability to provide. Uh, why abundance for them is the natural state. And it's uh, when you start to have scarcity and lack, that's because someone's not sharing properly there's there's no other explanation for it uh, when we start to experience a lack of abundance we being Western society um, we start to talk about uh, how we might improve the management strategies or uh, uh, some technical process that will solve this environmental or that environmental problem. Whereas the Mbengeli, they, they don't beat about the bush, they say it just as it is. You've got to share properly and treat resources respectfully if you want to experience abundance. It's that simple. Uh, and for some strange reason, uh, people don't understand. But they have the evidence of it in this extraordinary forest that has uh, you know, been here for tens of thousands of years with them living in it without uh, any stress or strain uh, and uh, and so um, I guess you know what what uh, I just like to end on is that you know by ignoring the importance of menstruation by casting it as a curse instead of as a blessing uh, we are actually deceiving ourselves and cheating ourselves of this very deep understanding that the Mengele have of the importance of negotiating our differences, of sharing properly, of structuring ourselves so that our interdependencies are explicit and recognized uh, for what they are uh, and not as part of manipulation, control, authority uh, and, and seeking to manage other people. Um, and you know, if we take the long view, and I don't know how many of you have been listening to Camilla's cos cosmetic coalitions and so on, but part of the reason why Chris, Camilla, and I have, have been so uh, 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 involved with one another is when I came back with all this fieldwork, it was just oh, oh all these all these things, and then I started to hear what they were saying. I was saying, gosh, and when they heard what I was saying, they started saying, gosh, you know, and and it just all it it really is quite remarkable how well uh, these different uh, understand and takes coming from very different positions from very different bodies of evidence really converge on this really significant feature uh, of women's first husband uh, being the moon and what we're actually doing in current society is we're returning back to this sort of primate social order the old gorilla style uh, you know Trumpy, Trumpy uh, type behaviors. And, uh, and, and, and that really is the heart of the problems that we're experiencing. Uh, and, and we really need to just be reminded of what the hunter-gatherers said, which other people have said too. Um, but I think Mahatma Gandhi said it very well. Thank you.